diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to be here again this morning. Topic this morning is holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Um, I'm going to do a two-part series on holiness. First part I want to speak about this morning is the part of the series on what is holiness, and the next part will be uh, my series will be on a more practical study of how to live a holy life. I'm going to break it in two. The inner holiness of a holy conscience and the outer holiness of a lifestyle. So we're going to start this morning with what is holiness. And you may ask, why would John Lapp speak on a subject like that? It's not one that we hear much of here at Weavertown. In fact, I don't think I remember it ever being preached. And I guess I could say I'm a little nervous this morning preaching the subject. It seems like a hard subject. Um, but a subject well needed for me, and hopefully the Spirit will lead in your lives, and you can be touched by the thought of holiness in your life also. Um, you wonder if this subject's important, and we say it can't be too important because we don't hear much of it. I don't agree with that. The word holy is found 600 times in the Bible. The word love is found about 300 times. Um, we know God was only called holy... God was called holy three times, holy, 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 as the Lord God Almighty, never used with any other words in the Bible. We'll talk about that in a bit. So I believe the subject is important, not one we always want to hear about, maybe a little mystical in some ways because God is holy. And we don't understand him completely, but it is a subject that I think we need to comprehend. Um, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's hard to hear the subject because we see ourselves as unholy people and sometimes don't desire to become holy like God. I also say this topic came um, about in the last year. I was thinking about this topic quite a bit um, and thought about giving a message on it and kept putting it, beside, uh, putting it away and finding other easier topics. Um, I think a lot of it came from my study on church history, on revivalists of the 19th and 20th century. Um, great men like Charles Wesley, 
um, Charles Spurgeon, um, and a lot of my um, yeah, a lot of my notes come from listening to some of their messages um, of revival. I don't think any of us here would disagree with me in the fact that we believe that our country needs a revival, or disagree with me in the fact that we probably understand in our own hearts that we probably need revivals, um, and yet how are we in the 21st century going to start a revival in our own lives, first of all? I want to open up with a quote by Charles Spurgeon. One feels most happy when blowing the trumpet of Jubilee, proclaiming peace to the broken hearts, freedom to the captives, and the opening of prison to them that are bound. But God's watchman has another trumpet, which he must sometimes blow. For thus saith the Lord unto him, Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Times there are when we must ring the alarm. Men must be startled from their sleep. They must be rounded up to inquire, who are we? Where are we? Where are we going? Um, and Charles Spurgeon, like he does so well, continues on with um, a lot of just um, earth-shaking things about um, we as humans here, are Christians, quote Christians, um, needing to wake up and get that revival. Like I said, the title of our message is Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's found in Hebrews 12, 14. And we're going to dig into that verse a little more um, this morning. The call of holiness in our life should always bring revival. In fact, all the great revivals in the last 200 years were centered around holiness. And we may wonder why are we not interested in revival. It may be because we're not too interested in holiness. Um, we can't move toward God without moving toward holiness. Is that right? God is holy. He's holy, holy, holy. We cannot move toward God without moving toward holiness. And there's no other way around it. So we have to take that and understand that holiness is an important part of Revival and of change and of growing and becoming more like Christ. Second Corinthians seven fourteen or Second Chronicles seven fourteen. We've heard this verse many times. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Here we see God telling the children of Israel at the dedication of the temple: If you humble yourself and turn from your wicked ways, seeking holiness, then you'll be healed then your land will be healed, and then your hearts will be healed, then your lives will be healed. I think one of the biggest problems of holiness for me is it costs too much. Um, it's something I don't want to look at because it may cost me too much to become more like Christ. When I look back at history and see the great revivals, I realize that revival takes a look at holiness. A call to holiness, <clears throat> and as I was studying, I'll say this, um, and for all of you who've studied a subject and given a message of some sort or another, whether it was a topic or something else, um, when you're in the middle of that study, the Holy Spirit often works in your life, and as I was going about my week, last couple weeks, and studying and listening to some of the sermons and reading about holiness, um, something would come up in my life, and I was always Face, come face to face with how does this pertain to holiness what, do, what decision do I have to make when it comes to this thought or this choice or this you name, name it so when we start thinking about holiness and we start believing in holiness it will affect the way we live why is holiness so unpopular I mentioned earlier Maybe it's a mystical thing. We think of God as holy. We can't be like that. Maybe one reason. Or maybe we believe it's just for the saints. And since I'm not a saint, I can't be truly holy. Or maybe holiness is old-fashioned. Something just for the older people, not for my generation. Or maybe it's just hard to be holy. And God really doesn't expect me to do hard things. After all, I'm a Christian, and holiness, does it really matter that much? Do 
does it? We know that answer. I think we've been deceived often to believe it doesn't matter. I know I have. I know I continue. I know the devil is going to continue to try to break into my life telling me it doesn't matter. Hebrews 12, 14. I'm going to quote this verse quite often. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I honestly believe it means just exactly what it says there. And if we do not follow holiness here on earth, we will come face to face to a holy God who will someday ask, why did you not hear my call to holiness in your life? Like it says in 1 Peter 1.16, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. I don't believe any one of us wants to die with the regret or the remorse of not living our lives for Christ. I don't think any of us here do. The story goes of an American doctor who lived a very loose lifestyle. And as he lay in his deathbed, he seemed to wake up from a, from a sort of stupor and said, Find that word, find that word. His family that was around him asked him, What word? Why, he said, that awful word. They said, What word? That word remorse, he said. Say it again, remorse. And then gathering up his full strength, he fairly seemed to shriek it out. Remorse. Write it down, he said. Write it down. It was written. And he said again, write it larger letters and let me gaze on it, underline it. And now he said, none of you know the meaning of that word. And may you never know it. It is an awful meaning. And I feel it now. Remorse. 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 None of us ever want to come to that day where we say, we have remorse for the way we lived our lives here on earth. We're all being called today to move towards holiness. And I love how it says in 1 Peter. You remember, remember Peter? The man who couldn't do too many things right, denied Jesus, kept messing up. Peter said this. Um, Wherefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, Hope in the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That was Peter. And we can relate to Peter, right? Um, I can. can <clears throat> but Peter realized that God is calling us, calling me to be holy. This topic of holiness was pressed on me while listening to a daily podcast one day by Albert Moeller. I don't know if you know of Albert Moeller. He has a podcast called The Briefing. It gives the morning news analysis for the day from a Christian perspective. And this topic came on one morning that um, kind of intrigued me. The topic that morning was on the Methodist church moving in a liberal way toward the sexual revolution and openly accepting gay marriages in their church. He went on to say, because of their growing conservative members outside of the United States, they're having a hard time accomplishing their agenda to accepting gay marriage. And the conservative groups outside of the United States were growing, and so the United States Methodists couldn't accomplish their agenda of bringing in gay marriage. By this time, news like this is probably rather normal to you, and as I listened um, to his podcast, I wasn't too surprised, and I was just thinking, okay, this is another church accepting gay marriage. Not surprising to any of us, that the Methodists would be trying to um, promote the sexual revolution in gay marriage. But what, was, what, what did catch my attention was in the podcast, he went on to say that the Methodists and their, have found a new definition for holiness. The word Methodist comes because men like John Wesley, the leader of the Great Awakening, and the father of the Methodist Church, believe there needs to be a method to holiness. That's where they're name came from. But the new Methodists are so committed to the sexual revolution that they're able to redefine holiness. So the great debate in the Methodist church between the conservatives and liberals is what is, how is holiness defined? And the new definition of holiness is this. We need to acquire an affirmation for all people regardless of their behavior. They're using words like tolerance, welcome, love wins all. Holiness is the acceptance and tolerance of all people regardless 
of their behavior or lifestyle. That's the new definition of holiness in the Methodist Church. The old definition of holiness in the Methodist Church, the biblical definition of holiness according to the Methodist Church, and this is found in, in their archives and their history and, and still spoken in, by many conservative Methodists, is this. Holiness is keeping the commandments of Scripture and following the words of Christ. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference they are like, Albert Moeller says, irreconcilable differences in their definitions? There's no way those definitions can come together. And they are admitting that we can't come together because our definition is different of holiness. Is this at all disturbing to you today? Or is this already have been accepted? <clears throat> Because this has already has been accepted in our communities that this doesn't disturb you this morning. We've heard it so often in so many churches. Here's the disturbing part of what Albert Mueller did say. He went on to say, this debate is not found just in the Methodist church, but prob probably found in our churches today. Is holiness redefined by what we call tolerance or love for others? Or do we still believe holiness is keeping the commandments of Scripture and following the words of Christ? I'm asking you that this morning. Where are we? Has that thought process infiltrated our church? Or do we honestly believe in holiness the way the Scripture, the way Jesus Christ taught it, the way the Word of God teaches it? So what is holiness? Now we get to the harder part of the message, um, and that's defining holiness. It's actually a very simple word, meaning sacred or set apart from the profane. It means unique or different, to be cut or separated from uncleanness. Holiness has the same root word as saint or sanctified. And when we think of holiness, we think of sanctification. I know that's a big word and hard for us to comprehend, and I'm not going to get into sanctification this morning. But that is what holiness is. It's a continuous sanctification, changes in our life, growing. Holiness carries on a relational thought, set apart. Now listen, catch this. Holiness carries on a relationship, set apart for God or belonging to God. So holiness is not a bad thing. It is a relational good thing. We are set apart for God. Okay? It's not... But the hard part is we live in a world that is pushing us to become like the world and not like the Father. Um, the word holiness or holy is found over 600 times in Scripture more often than any other word, uh, more often than love and many other words. Levit Leviticus 19.2 says, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I the Lord your God am holy. The word holy means to be set apart, and that's where our word holiday comes from. Some of you may know this. Holiday means holy day. It's a special day set apart. Okay? So the word holy just means exactly that. It's a special. We are special, and we are set apart. We are different. Um, now, that should sound good, but how many of us like to be different? Not many. We like to be celebrate our birthdays or celebrate a holiday and be special. But the problem is sometimes we feel when we're holy, we are different. And, and we are. Holiness um, is different. It's set apart. It's hard for us to comprehend holiness because only God is truly holy or completely holy. But the Bible does speak of many other holy things like holy scriptures, holy ghosts, holy nation. Holy Jerusalem, Holy Priesthood, Holy Kiss. Um, many other words are found in the Bible or are used in holiness. How can all these things be holy if only God is holy? But here's where we miss it. It's not only God holy. We can be holy. No, we're not going to be close to God. And we'll explain, I'm going to explain that a little more. But we can be holy. God wants us to be holy. Um, let's look at Let's, look at, let's, let's think of the thought. Let's think of this thought. God is love. So, does that mean we can't be loving? Of course not. Of course we can be loving, right? It's not hard for us to comprehend. God is holy. Does that mean we can't be holy? Of course we can be holy. Are we, holy, are we loving like God? Not even close. 
Can we be holy like God? Not even close. But we can still be holy. It's something we strive for, something we live to become like. And I'll talk more about that um, with that verse. Of course, he is completely and fully loving. Can we, in a small way, be loving? Sure we can. Can we, be in a small way, be holy? It's important that we are. Um, did you ever wonder why no one has a problem with wanting to be more loving like God, but so often we struggle with being holy like God? Ever wonder why? You think about that a little, little bit. It's not hard to comprehend that. You see, when we think of loving like God, we're thinking, um, uh, you know, the words for love. We all like that. Um, they all sound good. But when we think of holy like God, we think of separation. Um, the truth of the matter is sometimes we don't really have the right concept of love always either. Um, and sometimes we don't have the right concept of holiness. We should have the same desire for holiness as we have um, for love. So how holy is God? I'm just going to go into how holy God is here a little bit, and then we're going to talk about how we can be holy. Two places in the Bible we see God is called holy, holy, holy. Isaiah 6, um, and I don't think I'm going to go there. I was going to read those verses in Revelation 4. Isaiah 6 is where um, King Uzziah just passed away. And this is the last of the great kings. He was one of the top five kings of Israel. Um, and he was the last of the great saints. It was the last of the glory of Israel. And Isaiah comes to the Lord, or the Lord comes to Isaiah, and Isaiah meets the Lord. And you know the story of Isaiah meeting the Lord. Um, in Revelation 4, again, God is called holy, holy, holy. And it's where John, um, the revelator, meets the Lord. I'm just going to look at um, a couple places. As, look at what Isaiah says here. First of all, maybe I should step back. Repeating a word three times held an important value in the Hebrew language. The repetition makes it stand out as important. Like when Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he's saying, what I'm about to say is very important. Um, so when he uses the word holy, 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 what's he saying? I think the obvious is there. No other word is repeated three times about God. Um, holy is. It's very important. It's probably the most important subject on God. Um, that may be debated, debated, but it's the only word where God is, where holiness is repeated three times about God. In both Isaiah and Revelation, the word holy is used three times to emphasize God's holiness and to convey the completeness of his holiness. We can look at the Old Testament and see the responses of those who came in contact with God. And I'm going to just look at a couple of their responses. Isaiah meets God and says, Woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Job's response when he sees and hears from a holy God in a whirlwind. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. If you look at Moses, you know the story of Moses. Again, I, if you want to look at that, you'll find it in Exodus 33, verses 18 to 23. Moses speaking to the Lord, and he, like no, no one else um, in history, could speak to the Lord. But he wanted to see God. And he asked to see God. And what's God say? He said, you can't see my face. So he goes um, and says, you can see my back part. Um, and Moses, and he goes around the cleft of the uh, mountain, and he sees the back of God. I don't understand this completely. I don't know if this was God or Jesus Christ. Um, but anyways, he sees the back of God. And then he goes down into the mountain and sees the people. And what happens when the people see Moses? They back away and they said, I can't look. And Moses isn't God, was it close to God, but he became the reflection of God. And his, that reflection was so great that the people had to put veils over their faces um, to see Moses, um, who was with God and saw God. So we can see God is a holy God. I can't comprehend that completely. I can't understand that. But God is a holy, holy, holy God. He is completely separated from uncleanness, impurity, and set apart from the evils of the world. Look at what Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer. We know the Lord's Prayer was given to us to teach us how to pray. And it starts with a command. And you can look at it closely there and you'll see it. You may not see the command right away. But the first command of the Lord's Prayer on how we should pray was we should do what? The first request he makes to the Father, say command, request, is while he's teaching us to pray is that his name would be hallowed or that we would hold God's name as holy. 
Okay, the Lord, uh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's actually God, Jesus requesting that we would hold his name as holy. I'm going to ask this question. If in our country, um, we would all of a sudden abolish our constitution. For some reason, it would disappear and we couldn't find it. We don't know how to, to look for it. And you were asked to make 10 rules or a constitution. And in the constitution, you have 10 rules that you're allowed to make. What would you choose? Would you choose the Ten Commandments? Oh, sure, that sounds good. How about you can't have more than ten? So in our country, we have these ten rules, and one of these rules is, um, "Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in, name in vain." Seriously, for a rule that you only have the ten, and you're going to make that one of them, or another one, um, "Thou shalt take, um, thou shalt honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy." Would you really make that as one of the ten most important rules in our country? God did in the Ten Commandments. It was important to him. Holiness was important. Would we do that in our country? Would those rules be the most important? Are they? No. We don't take the Ten Commandments. But it, would that really make a better country? Well, in our minds we say yes, but would we really make that rule? You see, holiness matters to God. Now, the bigger question for us today or this morning may be, how can I be holy? And we're going to get into that a little bit. I'm not going to get into the practical part of that, but I want us to look at the verses here um, again in Hebrews 12. Let's first look at what our modern Christian church is saying and doing about holiness. R.C. Sproul has said this, Most of our American Christians walk in lockstep with mainstream America culture in practice. Is that true about our church? Is that what holiness is about? If we're walking in lockstep with our American culture, if our church is walking in lockstep. Um, let's look again at the verse in Hebrews 12 and dissect this verse. Um, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I love that verse. Um, and it what I like about this verse is the contrast you see. Follow peace and holiness. I mean, you say those two don't even, shouldn't even go together, do they? If we're holy, we're not going to be very peaceful. Um, yeah, they do. They may be one of those verses that, that brings out a contrast of peace and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Um, in the verse, being separated in holiness from the world, but finding peace in our relationship with people of the world. So God's asking us to do this. We're supposed to be separated, and yet we're supposed to find peace, live at peace with people around us. So what is the holiness Paul is talking about here? Here's the big question. And a lot of us, or a lot of evangelicals, and a lot of us maybe in our hearts have missed what this holiness is about. I'll be honest with you. I have. Is this holiness an imputed holiness? Now you say, again, you're... Maybe he's choosing a word that I don't understand what is. Is this holiness that we get when we become a Christian? Or is it a holiness that we need to continue to live? Some of you are probably saying, well, that's easy. When we become a Christian, we become righteous like Christ. I don't really think that's what it's saying here. And let's take a better look at the verse here and see what it says. Um, is it imputed holiness we get when we become a Christian? Is this something just given to us as a Christian, the holiness of God, given to us at rebirth because we don't have any good in ourselves? Paul says that our best righteousness is as filthy rags. Do we understand that we have no righteousness in ourselves? I think we as a church understand that pretty well. Um, and our best righteousness is as fil filthy rags. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I don't think that's what it's saying about holiness here. We're, talking, uh, we're not talking about imputed holiness. And again, I'm going to go back to Charles Spurgeon and something he said. He says, quote, now listen carefully. You're going to have to dissect this, and this may be um, a little hard, but let's go into the verse and let's take a deep breath and dissect what it's saying. He says this, they, they have said, that this is imputed holiness of Christ, something given to you at, at when you became a Christian. And you automatically have, and then it doesn't matter. Okay, We don't need to continue to strive because we have it. 
Do they not know when, what they are speaking of? This is Charles Spurgeon. That by an open perversion they utter that which is false? I do not suppose that any man in his senses can apply that interpretation to this context. Now before you stop me here, let's keep going. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Now the holiness meant is evidently one that can be followed like peace. How do we make peace? God gave us at birth, to, or when we became Christians, we became peaceful, right? And we never fight anymore. And we don't need to follow it because it was imputed to us. Is that true? I don't know what your house looks like. We have Christians at our house, but peace isn't always there. It's something we need to strive for and continue to do. Holiness is the same way. That's not, it doesn't take a rocket science, I don't think, to understand that. Let's keep, let's keep reading. Um, what he says, just like righteousness of Christ is given to us at rebirth, then this has to be another kind of holiness. It is, and Spurgeon goes on to say, no straining, no hacking at the text can alter it. There it stands, whether man like it or not. What he is saying is that this is a holiness we need to continue to live, one we strive for. There are some, he says, who for special reasons, best known to themselves, do not like it. Just as no thief likes a policeman, or, oh, that's you. <clears throat> yet there it stands, and it means no other than what it says. Without holiness, practical, personal, active, vital holiness, no man will see the Lord. Now, that's Charles Spurgeon's interpretation, but it makes sense to me. We cannot, if God is telling us to follow peace, that means it's a practical, it's something we're living the same way with holiness. It's something that is practical. It's something we continue to live. Holiness in the Bible is almost always connected with actual lifestyles, not just with some state of mind. It is very powerful, very practical, and very positive. Can we actually have this holiness? Now, some of you are saying, that doesn't line up with my view on grace. But remember, holiness is different than the holiness that's given to us at, birth, at rebirth, is different than the righteousness. And we'll talk about that maybe in a little bit. Um, or is it just for the, <clears throat> can we actually have this holiness? And some of you may be saying, now I'm wore out. I don't see me as ever being holy like Christ wants me to be. Or is it just something for the older saints here in the front church bench? Um, and if it isn't something imputed to us at rebirth, how can I get holiness? Well, let's, let's dive into more. Let's take a look at it. Some of you may be wondering, can I really get this? And if I don't have it, will I really not see God? I'll say this about our text. It doesn't say without the perfection of holiness, no man will see God. Thank goodness. None of us are perfect. It's not what it says. If that was the case, none of us would be able to see God. We're not perfect in holiness. It says... Um, doesn't say without perfection. You see, holiness is a thing of growth. It starts small and grows into a big tree. In our Sunday school lesson, we talked about the um, mustard seed. A mustard seed starts small. We become a Christian. When you became a Christian, were you a very holy person? No. You had that seed of holiness that continued to grow. And eventually, like some of the men in the front, women, men and women in our church here, you see big trees um, who have continued to grow in holiness. And that doesn't make you better because you're a big tree. What God is asking of us is to continue to grow in holiness. Strive. That's all he's asking. Continue to grow. But don't quit. Don't stop. Don't ever get to the place where you come complacent with your holiness. Because when we do, we are in a bad place. Um, let's keep going. It starts small when we're converted, and it continues to grow. And again, remember, holiness is not legalism or a works gospel. Our greatest works are filthy rags, like, like it says in Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as unclean things, and all our righteousness are filthy rags. And we do not fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. We, in our best righteousness, in our best holiness... We are still filthy rags, okay? Now, we can be big trees in holiness, but in comparison to God, we're still small. 
Um, and we can't take our holiness and say, God, I'm giving you this holiness. I deserve to see you, and I deserve to be uh, with you in heaven. No, absolutely not. It's not what it's saying. They're filthy rags. We just had a dog that had pups, and we had a bunch of rags there, and we were cleaning up. Uh, I know this sounds bad, but we were cleaning things up as the dog was having pups. That's the kind of filthy rags our best righteousness is. Okay, do we get it? I'm not saying we have righteousness or holiness that makes us, makes us able to, be, uh, to see Christ or makes us deserving of seeing Christ. Um, but yet holiness is something that we need to continue to grow in. And if we do not continue to grow in, we have a problem. Um, it is something we have to strive for. And just like we strive to have peace with all men, we strive to be holy. In both cases, holiness and peace with all men. If we decide this is not for me, I think the Bible is clear to say we will not see God. God is not for us if we reject this commandment. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Yes, everyone who is born again and has a relationship with Father can be holy, but we cannot claim the name of the Father without holiness. Like it says in Matthew, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of the Father who is in heaven. And the will of the Father is to strive for holiness. Now, the last part of my sermon I want to talk about, um, this may be help us a little understand holiness a little more. I'm going to give three groups of people who are not holy. Okay, And hopefully none of us fit in this group, but if we do, let the Spirit work. Let the Holy Spirit work in our lives. Um, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He continues to make us more holy. That sounds holy in itself, something I can't attain to, but that's what the Holy Spirit is. He's teaching us how to become more holy. Um, he is holy, and he's teaching us about holiness. The first group of people I want to uh, talk about here is the Pharisee or the hypocrite. The Pharisee and the hypocrite were not holy. The Pharisee lives 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 a life of law and ritual, or like the Bible says, ceremonies. He lives a life of ceremonies. He is following a form of truth, but not living out the humble walk of Christ. Um, he is quick to condemn others, but in his own quiet life, he is living another life of immorality, lust, and envy. Or he may be doing everything by the letter of the law at church, but at work, he's taking advantage of others, especially those weaker than himself. And this may be why he is so good at creating his wealth. He then uses his money to tithe and give to missions, feeling smug about himself and his Christian life. Or this Pharisee might be the kind that follows all the church standards. He looks good at church, but he hates his brother during the week. His brother may be the richer brother or the leader in the church or the brother that took advantage of him. If we hate our brother, we cannot be holy. You may think by all your good deeds or by following all the rules of the church, you can please God, but we can't. That doesn't bring holiness. No, this is not holiness. Just remind you again that your hopes and dreams built upon your own performance will fail in that day when you think you will need them most. And like our scripture text says, without holiness, we won't see God. So the hypocrite, the Pharisee, is one who doesn't have holiness. Next group is called the moralist. And I'm getting some of this from um, Charles Spurgeon. And who is the moralist? He's a man or woman who has never done anything wrong. He is morally upright. And we all say that's not us, but we have sometimes um, amongst us people who think they are real too good for other people. He's morally upright. He may not be the hypocrite that follows all the rules, but he is good to everyone. He will give his shirt off his back to help others. He's very moral. He is well liked everywhere because of his relational skills and his love for everyone. He takes care of the underdog and the hurting. This is not holiness before God unless our hearts are changed and we remember our best righteousness or like filthy rags. Holiness may and will exclude. I just heard the quote. Holiness may and will exclude immorality. But morality does not amount to holiness. Being good in our own doesn't amount to holiness. There are many men like this in church and outside of church. I know a man um, from camp or from the um, 
when I was living at camp. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. Never, never goes to church, um, but he seems like the best Christian you ever met. He doesn't have that relationship with Christ. Without the relationship with Christ, we cannot be holy either. Um, morality is earthly. Holiness is heavenly. The one belongs to the world. The other belongs to the world beyond the skies. You see, in heaven, it won't be said of God, moral, morality, morality, morality. What is said of God? Holy, holy, holy. And there's a difference. Morality is trying to do good on our own. Holiness is Christ living in us helping us to live a holy life. So being good in itself doesn't make us holy. Being moral in itself doesn't make us holy. Your best morality will not save you. You need to have more than this. For without holiness and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. It must be given to you of the Spirit of God. Without holiness, no man will see God. If we're one of these moralists who does everything right, it takes more than that to be holy and to see God. The third man is, I'm going to just use the word antinomianist, and some of you may have heard that word before. I'll just quickly um, give the definition for what he is. One who holds that under the gospel, dispensation of grace, the moral law is no more use or obligation because faith alone is necessary for salvation. This is the third group of people. And brothers and sisters, these are found probably within our church, probably I've take, t- taken a look at my life. Too often I see myself in this camp, believing I can do whatever I want and still be a Christian. That's an, ant- that's an antinomianist. We find many professing Christians in our country, in, our group, <clears throat> in this group, and I believe this group is often the one we are often most attracted to. Why? Because it's the one where we can do as we please and still believe we're holy in Christ. It's not possible. Um, brothers and sisters, this group is in very rocky soil. They come when they come before the holy God. This group knows the word of God. It's good at pointing out all theology. Um, knows the word, verses in the Bible. Has gone to seminary in some cases and knows theology. And yet, holiness is not in their vocabulary. They're excellent speakers of the Christian life. And it's, and it's theology. They say it is all about the inward but their fruits are lacking, therefore telling the world that living a holy lifestyle doesn't matter. They don't like teachings from the book of James. They say faith without works, that say faith without works is dead. Neither do they like to hear the words of Jesus in the gospel or Paul's instruction um, on sexual immorality or Christ's teaching on divorce and remarriage or loving our enemies or living separate of the world. They say as Christians, all that matters is the inside. My question for them is the same as James' question, how can we have faith without works? Or may I say, how will we be able to see God without holiness? In conclusion, I'd like to say this. Before we put everything around us in one of these groups, or put everyone around us in one of these groups, let's take a look at our own lives. Where are we at? Do we fit in one of these groups? If we do, let's stop right where we are, And be reminded again of our need to grow in holiness. Because if we do not have holiness or a desire or a groaning to be holy, we will not see God. That's serious business. And I think every one of us needs to daily, continually remember that. I was reading um, from one of the the, um, revivalists and he said this. He said, when I read the story of David, I tremble. Because David started out so right um, and fell. And we should all remember that none of us are exempt from falling. We need to continually strive, groan, move towards God in holiness. Holiness is not just what we don't do. It is very much what we positively do. God is calling us now to present ourselves wholly to God. Because if we don't do it now, we won't be able to do it when we meet our holy maker. Romans 6.19 says, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you have once presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Or like the NIV, or King James says, leading to holiness. God is asking us today to live a holy life. If we expect to see him, 
I do understand this is a high calling, but only those willing to follow this calling will be worthy to be called sons and daughters of Christ. And that needs to be us. Not that we look holier than others, not that we think we are holier than others, but that we have a striving to follow Christ in holiness and do what his word says. God's calling us to do that. In closing, I'm going to give, a, I'm going to give you a story about a man wanting holiness but not willing to go, not willing to let go of the pleasure of the world. I hope this is a reminder this morning for all of us that following God to holiness is important. The story goes of a gentleman high in position in this world with many lands and a large estate who when he took a preacher by the buttonhole after a sermon, he said to the preacher, he never hears me, <clears throat> he never hears me preach without weeping, said he to me. Or, sir, does it seem such an awful thing that I should be such a fool? And the preacher said, and what for? He said, for the sake of the world and for those pleasures of life and of the mere honor and dre of dress and fashion, I'm squandering away my soul. I know, he said, I know the truth, but I do not follow it. I have been stirred in my heart to do what is right. But I just, but I go on just as I've done before. I fear I shall sink back into the same state as before if I change my life. Oh, what a fool I am, he said he, to choose pleasure that only lasts a little while and then to be lost forever and ever. The preacher pleaded hard with him, but, the, but pleaded in vain. There was such intoxication in the pleasures of the life that he could not leave it. The preacher went on to say, Alas, alas, if we had to deal with that same man, our preaching would be easy. But if we'd have to deal with sane men, our preaching would be easy. But sin is madness, such madness that when men are bitten by it, they would not be persuaded, even though one should rise from the dead and tell them. And the, I want to end with, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Let's kneel together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning that you care about each one of our lives. You love us. Um, you want to live in our lives, and you want to move us towards holiness. Thank you for um, your word and the teachings of your word. Help us to strive to um, look at your word and and to strive to become more like you. Thank you, God, that even though we are not holy in ourselves,